or minutes from last week or um, the 27th? Um, I move to accept. Second. Move, move to discuss or accept? Accept. Accept, yeah, okay. Second. Yep, okay, we're good. Okay. Um, comments from the public before we go to Lynn? That's not on the agenda? No? Okay. Um, Peggy, you'll excuse us for a second while we take care of a couple things? So, we, um, Lynn and I received a request from the Community Preservation Committee that the select board consider calling a special town meeting on March 27th to um, allow residents to vote on appropriating $50,000 of CPA funds to pay down um, the existing loan for the Town Hall Historic Rehabilitation Project. Um, the reason it needs to be done quickly is that the existing note um, comes due April 18th, so we can't vote on April 30th to pay something that's due April 18th. So um, the additional, there was additional match, there was additional CPA match that was given by the state to CPA communities, and that was around, I think it was in the ballpark of $44,000 and it was $6,000 of uh, unused administrative expenses from the prior fiscal year. So there's, the CPC feels um, like it would be a good decision to pay down $50,000 you know, when we renew the note. So we're, we're renewing the note for $50,000 less. So it'll save us that, those interest costs. Debt service costs, right? Right. So how much is left in the debt service for that? Um, well, it was originally 400,000 maybe we might have a better idea, uh, but it was four hundred thousand. They had voted previously ninety three thousand, but that would include the interest payment. So uh, that's about close to seven thousand for interest. So um, you say eighty. So four hundred thousand minus the eighty thousand, eighty six thousand, and then another fifty thousand off of it will so bring it down to oh, two sixty something. Two just north of two. Yeah. 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 Well, two sixty something. Yeah. So that's a little bit more than just that's yes. with the two. So. Okay, well, that's good. Good, so great. Okay. That's Article One. Article Two is so so we're doing a series of, of one year notes mm -hmm. at least to, to start, or we can do it. I believe up to ten years, but there's an issuance cost each mm -hmm. year to do the, the one year note. So that's what Article Two is for five hundred fifty dollars. That's the fee for the mm -hmm. uh, for the issuance cost of one year note. And then Article Three here is it's come to our attention that. Um, one of our employees who was entitled to a longevity bonus, mm -hmm. 250, the 250 that was budgeted for for the past two years, hasn't received it. Oh, has not received. Has not received it. When were they due it? It was it like FY for 2017. Right, but, uh, when, but it was it three years, two years, one year. Uh, two years, right? I believe it was for it was the past two, two years. years. 2017 and 2018. Oh, okay. Um, and that's Article Three, and then the, that's the only three articles on there. Okay. And then they're all worded correctly so that no one stands up at the town meeting and says, I have approval of town council on this, so it doesn't mean you're right. That means I can blame somebody else. <laughs> yeah. A lot of good that'll do. <laughs> all right, while well, we're signing that, thanks for um, is there anything else we should do before we get to Peggy? Brian? Um, I, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, Peggy, you're up. Okay. Um, I'm basically here as an emissary from uh, Franklin Regional Council of Governments. Um, I wanted to tell you just really briefly what I do. I started a nonprofit organization in 2016, Western Mass Pollinator Networks, and it was basically in response to the horrible decline in pollinators we're seeing worldwide. Um, since then, we, we have passed six town resolutions to become pollinator friendly communities. We've done dozens of uh, public presentations and uh, there's actually three towns that are building pollinator corridors throughout, like urban <coughs> pollinator corridors. Uh, we just held a symposium in January uh, with 90 people in attendance for um, institutions and towns on uh, sustainable land care. Mostly colleges and, and uh, city employees came to that. So there's a lot of momentum in, in you know, really rolling up our sleeves to do something to help the pollinators. Uh, basically, the habitat has been taken away, uh, climate change, pests, um, diseases. So there's a lot of threats right now. And um, restoring habitat is one of the best things that we can do 
Um, so uh, I'm, we're collaborating all over Western Mass. <clears throat> And uh, one of the handouts I, I gave you is uh, just an excerpt from um, uh, maybe a distant relative, uh, a relative of uh, Frederick Orlowski. <laughs> Vivian Orlowski um, in Great Barrington is on the Agricultural Commission, and she uh, was responsible for hiring the Conway School to, to um, create a pollinator action plan for the, the city of uh, the, the town of Great Barrington. Um, it's a, an amazing plan, and it, and it gives all kinds of scenarios for increasing good ho uh, pollinator habitat. And one of the authors, Evan Abramson, is now employed as a planner at FERCOG, and FERCOG is in the process of planning and raising money to build an all Franklin County pollinator corridor. Um, it'll use a lot of the existing byways and highways, you know, along rivers, through towns, uh, uh, along roads, and um, just good habitat that's out there. Um, so the reason I came here is, is not only to tell you information, but he has uncovered a state grant, um, and they're very interested, and in, they've never done anything for pollinators. It's a, he can't even tell us where it is, because he <coughs> wants to be competitive. Um, but they will find out at the beginning of April uh, when the due date is and the whole grant process will be laid out and they're looking for towns that might be interested in being a part of that pollinator plan that they're doing um, there could be funding within that grant for the interested in participating towns to to do something for pollinator habitat and when he gets the uh, the grant language um, sometime in mid-may the, the grant is going to be due and he'd like to have as many participating towns submit a letter of support a letter of interest. And so we're kind of doing a dog and pony show to come out and see um, you know, which towns in Franklin County might want to do that. And if you thought you were interested, kind of more information would you need from us? Um, do you have to consult with any of your other town committees? That, that kind of information. Questions you guys? What do you think the, the main issues are for pollinators and weeding? Good question. Uh, growing food. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, because I, oh, I, I was oh, reading I your your um, uh, the article yes. that you wrote from you brought from Plainfield, um, and it uh, seems like a lot of it is about not using insecticides. I'm not sure that we can dictate to the farmers no. what insecticides and, they use, but yes. when, but it's like. Mm -hmm. It seems like either like for town properties where we might or might not use. Yeah, typically what we're trying to do with a resolution is only ask towns on their own properties to look at their land care practices. Um, do you really need to have this huge lawn with chemicals on it, or can you let part of it become a meadow? Um, not use any pesticides, and we haven't mentioned glyphosate, but. Um, you know, we're getting, we've got these six towns to adopt those kinds of um, uh, practices, but none of the towns are saying anything about agriculture because that's sometimes a decade old uh, owned, you know, family property. Um, of course, uh, lots of people are talking about it, but that isn't going to be what the grant is focusing on. It's going to be focusing on um, finding the best habitat to build pollinator, uh, you know, to increase the amount of native plants, um, plants that would attract uh, the native bees that are here. And honeybees get affected too, in a good way. Is there a list of those types of plants? Many. But but easily accessible for the town to think about it as we're thinking about what we may or may not choose to plant. Yes. And I wouldn't pretend you mean to mean municipal? You mean on municipal property? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Evan is has some lists. Uh, Tom Sullivan is one of our educators. He's got some lists, so we have lists. If any towns that are interested, we can provide resources, and we're all volunteer, um, so we, we would like to work with any towns. I don't interested. know, other than the fields at Hurley, which obviously need to be managed and cared for. Yeah, athletic fields. Field, athletic okay. fields, yeah. Um, I don't think we put down anything on, we don't have that much town Probably, yeah. land anyway, and farmers, I mean, they, last time I checked, probably need the bees. 
to you know right. pollinate their crops. Um, you know, I know that near me, Quan Quan certainly needs a bee or two uh, in their apple orchard and in their in their blueberry bushes. And there's a there's a guy who owns a pretty big bee. He's a bee guy. Yeah. What do you call a bee guy? Yeah. Who is that guy? Apiary. Apiary. What? Well, apiary would be the... Yeah, and, yes. and so the um, they actually communicate at, at some level. I'm sure she wants all his bees to fly up the hill exactly. and then go home. And that, you know, I, I'm... So I, I think we're... So the resolution is just to show you an example of what some towns have, have gone for. The FERCOG grant will have nothing to do with passing a resolution. It'll just be, if we do this plan, do you want any carters, any, any land within the town to be, to be considered for building better pollinator habitat? It might include, you know, putting um, the right kind of hedges in. Uh, hedges are a great, hedgerows are a great way to have uh, pollinators uh, nest and, and feed. They're early, so it, it really affects the bumblebees. So it, it's not going it, to, I just, gave that to you to show you what some towns are going to, but um, I would love it if more towns would pass, uh, pass um, resolutions. In Northampton, the planner there said, just get busy doing pollinator habitat. Don't bother with the resolution. They're not binding. So, you know, it's both and. Um, it, the, the resolution is a way to educate people. You have to educate in order to pass a resolution. So, um, Windsor, uh, didn't pass the resolution, but they got really, really busy in creating a huge pollinator habitat. So it's just a tool, basically. So um, we'd be interested in having you participate if, uh, when he submits his grant, to have a letter from, it has to be signed by the select board. Um, it doesn't have to be long, but you know, we could help you ghostwrite something or give you some main points. Um, and then if and when he gets the grant, than the study that he would do to find good pollinator habitat um, uh, would include lately. I would think we should uh, at least inform the, the Agriculture and Ag Commission about this uh, for their input and if they have any uh, comments on, on this. Uh. And I could ask Evan if he foresees the grant having any sections on, you know, giving some guidelines to agriculture. I don't know the super details of what he's planning to do, but if there's anything I could find out from his point of view, how it may um, give opportunities to farmers, I'd love to do that for you. And the other thing I noticed, uh, mowing along the roadside, I don't know if we should ask Keith if that's gonna be a concern. You know, you're talking in this one article about limiting mowing along roadsides. Uh, well, they we mow all the time. Yeah, they, so. Well, they mow once a year, pretty much. Well, they mow, I don't know if all the time really. Well, the, right? it could be several times they mow. I don't, I don't keep track, but if if that's going to affect his mowing operation to say only once a year or only at intersections and nowhere else, maybe, yeah. I, I don't know. And, and what we're trying to do is provide information about ways you can mow, for instance, at our uh, symposium. Um, like everyone, everyone mows. <laughs> and uh, we have some um, examples of towns that reduced their mowing bill by $1,000 because they just altered what they were doing that still met their needs, but also, you know, it, like it mowed right beside the road, but didn't do that drastic mowing that some some highways do because um, it's not needed for visibility so I don't think there'd be any um, requirements they're basically finding properties that are that want to participate so um, you know the town is just endorsing this is a great idea you know we'll, we'll help you with our GIS maps to you know we'll tell you what we know we'll introduce you to some places um, so it could be private land it could be municipal land that comes up on the survey when they try to identify some properties. I think, I like this, but I, I think it probably makes sense to get any information you have to the Ag Committee for agricultural purposes. The, 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 the mowing piece that we can get to our highway superintendent, so he's informed, so that before we take a formal vote 
or go to town meeting. I don't know whether it's uh, is it us or is it town meeting? Sounds like they're they're not it's necessarily select board. Board. It's select board. Yeah. Before we make a vote here, we've at least informed the stakeholders that need to be informed, Absolutely. and they have yeah. a best they, practices list that they can say, yeah. "What are you nuts?" They or, want that to happen too. Right. Um, more dialogue, as much dialogue as you think is needed without going to town meeting. A resolution would be needed for town meeting, right. but just um, to participate in the grant and actually. Anything they identified in this plan would probably have to be okayed by the property owner. So, whoever that was. What the timeline are you looking at for the submission of this grant? Um, the grant is due sometime in May, so they'd like the letter at the end of April. Oh, so we got a little bit of time. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. All right, so Peggy, if you can get Brian that information, then he can okay. distribute it to those stakeholders. Is there any other stakeholder can you guys think of that CONCOM maybe or not? No, they don't. Well, I think, it, I mean, I'm sure it heads up. I mean, Scott always loves to see this stuff, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe anything anything that you distribute to, to con cons or experiences, best practices that Plainfields or Great Barrington's or Windsor's or Northampton's has distributed to their con coms? Yeah. Just so we're not leaving anything un right. unturned? Um, Great Barrington might be the deepest in the activities they've done, so. Uh, I'll, I'll see what they did down there as far as making it known that they were doing it. They're building an urban pathway, so they're going to affect a lot of municipal properties. Um, you're so rural that maybe more private lands would be identified as possible participants. Hard to say. What would, what would you say to a person who says, well, this is so rural, we've got pollinators all over the place. Um, there is, there's so much uh, forested land. There's you know, uh, not that much that's mowed, I suppose, other yeah. than if you're thinking of, you know, cutting down of crops as being mowing. So, so what, um, I mean, I sort of feel like we have a lot of pollinators. We, uh, would this grant also kind of assess, you know, where, the, where does the town stand already in terms of pollinators? Because yeah. it, it might be that we're actually in really good, compared to a city, we're probably in pretty good shape as far as having pollinator habitat. I, you can actually, always improve, yeah. of course. But. I've actually been wondering that myself. Isn't, aren't the rural lands already fine? And one thing that we really need is a lot of citizen scientists really sampling. Um, one of the scientists we work, from, I work with from WPI, we were all doing some, a little bit of sampling for him last year. And towards the end of the summer, we only found one species of bumblebee everywhere. And it should have been seven species. So. We know that we know there's a decline, but we don't have data on that. But um, I'm gonna I'm gonna run these questions by Evan as well, because I think if he's doing Franklin County, he's gonna get that question all the time. Um, Pollinators the, bring more birds too, so that's good. Thing. The last thing that I'm wondering is some type of testimony list of testimonials from pollinators about why this is important to what they do. I, again, I'm thinking about, about the, the, the person who lives across the street from me. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm not sure, I, I don't, I'm not saying that he would have anecdotes, to, to, but, but beekeepers, etc. they might have a list of towns should do this because if they don't, here are the cons, or here, here's, here's, here's what happens if they don't, but here are the positives if they do. Yeah. That I don't, I'm just, the more information, the better. But I think this is great, and if you can get this to Brian, and then we can have a conversation, a subsequent conversation in here okay. before the end of April, like you asked for. How often do you meet? Twice a month. Every yeah. two weeks. Yeah, about every two weeks. So is it like first and third, second and fourth? Second and second last. Second and last. Oh, second. Oh, second. So if it happens to be a five-week month, it's... Last Wednesdays. Or? Yes. Okay. All right. At six o'clock. I'm glad to help. Normally it's six. Yeah, normally six, but it's. Okay. I'm guilty. Thank you, Peggy. It's good to see you. I know. I it's been far too long. I came over here and saw all those panels everywhere. You know, when I retired, I saw the panels everywhere. And I went, oh my God. Right. From years of work. Right. Years and years. Now I want to see pollinator meadows. There you go. Next to the panels. Yeah, yeah they could be pleased. Oh, uh, there's, there's the guidelines panels. for that now. Under the panels. Oh, that'd be interesting to see. Yeah, too. I will get those for you. Yeah, that'd be really cool to see. What were you going to say? Under the panels. That's oh. all I was going to say. Yeah. 
uh, Hampshire did a big study on that to see if the agricultural land would and somehow be negatively affected by putting pollinator plants under it. So um, we'll see. But there's guidelines. That's cool. That'd UMass be great. Guidelines. Thanks. Thank you. All right, uh, Brian, what's the, we did this town meeting, so real estate technical assistance grant. Yeah, do we want to? You want to take Jim? Since he, that's what he has to sit here? It's up to you guys. Okay, Jim, what do we got? You can say no. Mm -hmm. No, that's fine. <laughs> no, okay. I'll leave. Um, so I had submitted a proposal a while back, and I just wanted to take the opportunity and thank you for giving me the opportunity to come in and just answer any questions you guys might have, um, give you an overview if you'd like, um, for a request to hire an additional full-time officer uh, for the town of Waitley. So I'm not sure if you guys all have that in front of you. Hopefully you had a chance to review it. We're in the, Amy, we're in the same. Yeah, we can send them back there. Towards the end, because he's on the agenda. Yeah. 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 It's right before town administrator updates. What's that? It's back. We got that tab. Why don't you give a brief overview, Jim? Okay. Yeah, this is three pages. Well, in your words, so three pages of information. So, um, just starting, I guess, starting back from the beginning, <clears throat> not the beginning of time, but the beginning of our modern day uh, police department. So, back in the early 1990s, um, there's some grants that came out, COPS grants that came out that gave uh, towns an opportunity to hire full time officers and they provided money over a three-year period um, to hire those officers, pay a portion of their salary, it changed each year and went from 75% to 50% to 25%, and then the town had the option um, after the grant was expired to, to keep those officers. So you had one officer that was hired back in the early 90s. Uh, that turned into another officer that got hired in um, the late 90s, and so, First officer retired, second officer comes in, takes a position. So late 90s, we really have our the start of our full-time full -time police department. As everybody's well aware of the location that we were at originally to begin with, uh, the basement at the center school, that's where they functioned out of. So I came into the picture in 2000, the year 2000, uh, came to the town of Waitley after working um, for a few years prior in, in the town of West Springfield as a part-time police officer there. And coming in 2000, coming from a department that was a little bit more modernized at the time than, than what we were, um, that started kind of a, a growth period. It was community policing grants, money was coming out, uh, money was given to towns for equipment and things like that. So, so our department has been built up a lot um, over the last couple of decades. Um, 2001, I became a full-time officer in the town, and then 2004, I was appointed the full-time police chief after our uh, previous chief retired. So taking over in 2004, that gave us a full-time police chief and a full-time officer. So since that time frame, um, we've had two full-time officers. The town has continued to grow, in, in my opinion, looking at the dozens of, of houses that have been um, developed some industry that's come in looking forward to some additional industry that's that's going to be coming in um, namely uh, marijuana facilities whether it's manufacturing retail establishments so we're, we're looking at more continued growth um, doesn't look like there's any less people that are looking to build uh, there's more and more houses going up we still have a housing development where there's houses being built continually so I see a lot of a lot of growth. With that growth has come, you know, an increase in traffic, an increase in number of calls. We now have a record management system, which started last year, 
which gives us a better idea statistically of, uh, of what we're doing as a police department, the number of calls that we're getting. So in the, in the handout, <clears throat> um, I had in there, I think it was four to, four to 500 calls per month. Um, yeah, four to 500 calls per month in 2018. The system was rolled out, the new record management system was rolled out in 2018. So we're now almost a year into it. And so we've got better ideas. More officers are entering calls that they actually you know, initiate themselves. We're getting more calls entered into the system. Um, these aren't necessarily 911 calls. There's a list uh, of things, some examples of things that I, that I put on here for the types of calls that we're getting, but still, it's activity is something that something that the town's doing our police department is doing um, generating th this type of call volume um, we're probably closer to 600 calls at this point um, per month with everybody getting their um, getting their calls entered in the system so calls can range from anything from you know, motor vehicle just sit sitting on the side of the road doing radar slowing people down all the way up and until 911 calls for whatever reason, breaking and entering into houses, assaults, domestic violence cases, um, larceny cases. Um, a lot of it's identity theft now, online types of crimes. Um, we're investigating a crime right now. A person had $4,000 taken, uh, taken out of their, their business account. So we're constantly seeing more and more of this, this type of thing coming out, which requires a, but more a different kind of skill set than just you know the community policing officer that's out on the street just talking to people and and getting to know the community and you know, doing their area checks we're, we're doing a lot of investigative work um, on investigative work we also handle the majority of, of the cases that involve evidence breaking and entering into houses um, prior to hiring I'd say from because we were still doing it a little bit in the early 2000s but before that the state police we used to call them in for a lot of things for you know for the minor breaking and enterings they come in and you know, fingerprint the house dust dust for fingerprints or collect evidence to process and things like that the state police is a great great organization but for if they came to a house and we had a doorknob that had a fingerprint on it and we they came and took it and brought it to their lab and processed it. And by the time we get the information back, it could be six months, it could be a year. We've had some DNA evidence at the lab for a year and a half, um, waiting, to get, waiting to get processed. So, so these types of things take a while. There are some things that we have to submit to them just because we don't have the resources. But for the most part, we can handle most of those cases now. Um, I've you gone through the DNA. training. I'm sorry. You can do DNA. We can't do. That's one thing that we have to. We have to send. We can't process so DNA. We can collect it, but we can't process it. What, what are the ones you can do then? You were talking about fingerprints and DNA. Yep. So the the bigger the biggest thing that we're doing right now is uh, fingerprint processing. So processing a, a scene, trying to collect the, the fingerprints. Once those are collected, we can analyze those fingerprints. We can process those fingerprints. Uh, we can compare those fingerprints if we have a suspect. We can enter those fingerprints into the state system to to check statewide, nationwide, to see if those fingerprints appear in any cases and, and try to find a match. Um, we don't have the technology as far as computers yet go to be able to do it ourselves, but we can process it and then submit it to the lab um, to have them enter it, the state police lab, to have them enter it into the into the system. That. That takes a lot less time than the actual processing of the evidence and comparisons and analyzing and all that stuff because of the staff that they have. There's cases that take priority over what we would be submitting. So those types of cases, I mean, we've, we've turned cases around in the course of you know days or weeks instead of months or years for processing evidence. We also collect evidence. We can collect DNA evidence. We can collect um, any basically visible evidence because we don't have the, the technology, the equipment to be able to use different light sources and things like that to look for evidence, um, but trace evidence, things like that. But we can, we can process scenes. The biggest thing that we're dealing with is property type stuff. So it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's an invaluable tool that we have to be able to do that ourselves. 
Um, we also process our own um, crashes, crime scenes, as far as crime scene photography goes. Um, there's two of us that, that can take um, photographs of crime scenes because there's a specific way to do it and um, gathering evidence and photographing evidence, things like that. So um, we can process all that stuff ourselves in-house as well. So those are, those are some of the things investigatively, how we're evolving, growing with time. Um, there's, no, there's no shortage of things to do. Um, again, with increased number of people coming in, increased number of calls, we're spending more and more time doing that, which is fine. I have no issue with that. The only issue that I have is we also have a lot of administrative duties that we, we handle as well. And the administrative duties are just astronomical these days, the, the things that we're required to do, um, the things that we do in-house, we don't have administrative assistance or anything, so we're, we're literally cleaning and taking care of everything, returning phone calls, emails, answering you know, walk-ins to the station, just general complaints, um, whatever it may be administratively that we do. There's a list that's probably longer than I am tall of administrative things that we do. I have a, a second full-time officer, a sergeant, that I delegate a lot of duties to him just because I can't handle everything. <clears throat> um, so there's a number of duties that, de that get delegated to him. There still are a lot of duties that, that I have to take care of. Namely, during the day is what my biggest concern is right now because um, we have classes that we have to go to, meetings that I go to, trainings that we go to. There's all kinds of different things. Every time I would go to a meeting, that's a time when somebody's not patrolling the community. Um, every time I'm, I'm outside of town, whether it's for training, meeting, or anything else, that somebody that's somebody not patrolling the community. It's my job and kind of my, um, my mission statement, if you will, is to provide the, the highest quality level of service that we can to the community of Waitley. And at this point, I don't feel that I can do that at the highest level that um, of the standard that I set because of that, because there's so many so many times where there's there's not somebody there because I'm, I'm gone for two hours or an hour for a meeting, or I may be gone for the morning, or I may be gone the whole day, or I may be gone for, for two days. Um, so part of this request is having somebody to be able to work a day shift as well. And it's not just it's not just me that's that's going through this. This is kind of a, a change in law enforcement, if you will, because of the administrative duties that there's so many towns in Franklin County, and I listed some of them in here that I know have three full-time officers and that they're, they have two people on during the day because they're, they're, their chiefs are going to the same meetings that I'm going to, the same trainings that I'm going to, and doing the same thing. So they don't want to leave their communities um, uncovered as well. So that's kind of the main reason that I'm looking for. Not that, not that we, we can't handle things or we can't process things or we're not you know, if I'm at my desk doing something administrative and a call comes in, obviously I'm going to the call, but that just puts the administrative stuff aside until the call's done. Um, last week, there was probably, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, I know I had one, one incident where I had to escort um, somebody to a house, and that probably took two, three hours, so I couldn't really leave that person at the house go do something else. I had to kind of stay there with them to keep the peace. That's kind of a common thing, whether it's a domestic violence case and somebody has to go collect their belongings out of the house. If it, usually if it goes more than an hour or so, I'll tell them that they have to hire a police officer to sit there and, and watch because I'm not gonna sit at somebody's house while they move all their belongings out for three or four hours. It's just not the, the best use of our time. So um, there, there are, like I said, there are a number of the administrative things, which is my, my big concern. But bringing somebody else in, I could delegate some, some more of those administrative duties, because um, I don't want to have two of us sitting in the station 10, 20 hours a week um, doing administrative stuff. That's less, less patrols that we're going to have out on the road. So um, they're not divided evenly, but they're divided, right now they're divided to the point where I can take some of the things off my plate, the full-time sergeant can deal with those things, and then he can get out on patrol and, and respond to calls as well. So, so it's, it's really getting to a point where we don't have um, 
the the staff the ability to you know, to cover that when when we're dealing with all the administrative stuff. And right now, I'm looking at an average 20 plus hours a week, which is it doesn't seem to be going down. It seems to be going up, and it's everything from being the in-house computer IT guy, having to take care of all the record management stuff, dealing with social media platforms that we have. You know, it's some of those things have they're they're not getting taken care of as as frequently as as I would wish, but some of those things get pushed behind because there's more more pressing things that, that need to be taken care of. So um, so there's a, a great deal of things that that would certainly help the community of Waitley get people out there being more more proactive again especially during the day um, when there's higher traffic volume I mean I, I don't after all of that stuff I, I don't have a lot of time to go out and just do traffic control or you know stop cars and, and I know we, we get the complaints you know, people speeding on this road people going through this stop sign and I just I just don't get the opportunity that often to, to get out there and, and do that because of the administrative stuff so Really getting to be a burden. Yeah, I have, I have some. Uh, you're talking about doing fingerprinting and crime scenes investigations and all that. How many of your staff are, are trained and capable of doing that? Two of us, two full time officers. Okay, so none of the part timers, just you and the, and the sergeant. Correct. And how often does that occur? Uh, well, it, it varies. I mean, Trying to think. Two two years ago, I think we had eleven breaking and entering cases that we were investigating throughout the year. Oh, there was eleven cases. There. I'm sorry. That was when we had that sort of spate of break-ins. Yes, yeah. and, it, and it goes in cycles. I I don't have any wood to knock on. If if you're superstitious, <laughs> knock on some wood. But last year, all around us, it was just just a wave of breaking and entering cases that that came through. Hampshire County, Franklin County. For some reason, it went kind of around because everybody around us had had issues as well. We saw some of it, but not not at the level some some towns were. I mean, there was some towns were getting an entire street where there just every house was broken into, or every car on an entire street. So those things happen, and it could they could start tomorrow. We just we just don't know. Um, but again, I'd, I'd like to be so that's like in a year, maybe a year. You have something like 10 or 11 yeah, situations where you have to, a yeah. dozen a year. Yeah. Okay. Um, and again, those, those aren't just, you know, go to the house, take a report, thank you. Here's, here's your report for the insurance company. That's bringing evidence back and processing, which again, takes takes us off the road in order to, to process all that stuff. Yeah, but so. it's, uh, it's still part of your job. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I want to be able to do that still and be able to provide Know, the, the coverage for the for the town so if, if we did have a case I could work that case and we could have somebody out on the road answering the call so I don't have to stop in the middle of it you know try to fume something in the tank and I get a 911 call and kind of screws up the whole process and is, is the state police uh, increasing their staffing I don't to handle all, all this all this extra stuff you say is coming down and the extra population uh, extra businesses coming in. What, what is the state police doing to handle that, to address that? Are they doing anything? Um, from their perspective, I, I think they've been short-staffed for, for a number of years. If you look at the the Northampton State Police Barracks, that's what, that's what covers our area, but they also cover all of Hampshire County. They cover from Holyoke to the Waitley Town Line, including Sunderland and Leverett. For Franklin County, but they cover all of those towns, and a lot of those towns, they they have part-time departments, they have on-call officers, they have you know departments that you know that don't staff anybody, so they're they're responding to their calls, so and usually problem? they they have three patrols and a desk. So is, uh, that, is that a problem for us? They're not responding when we need them, or when you're not there, and there's a need for police presence. Uh, if, it, if it's something serious, I mean, they'll, they'll respond if it's something serious. There may, no, there may be a delay, that, but... Is that, is that a problem? Do we have that problem here where when you or your staff are not in town or don't respond and we rely on the state police to come or adjoining towns, 
is that a problem? Is that an issue in this town? Do we have that as an issue? At, at some level. I, I wouldn't go flat out to say that, yes, it's a problem. Um, but there is there is some level if it's if it's a pass somebody comes home from from vacation for example and they say hey it looks like my house was broken into if it doesn't look like it's broken into right then and there maybe a, a pass B and E they say police may say well we'll save that for tomorrow when Waitley comes on they'll take care of it well, you know, they'll they, come and investigate but I guess I to follow up with Brett how many they must if they can't respond or if they choose not to I don't whichever one there must be a record kept of of when they can't be a backup for us. There must be. I, I don't know that there's a time where they can't respond. Um, if, it's, if it's a minor B&E, and it's things that, that we deal with. I can call the lab, I can call crime scene services and say, hey, we have a B&E. Well, okay, well, we had two murders that we're dealing with, we had this, we had that. So it's going to be a while before we get there. See what you can collect for evidence, and then we'll take it to the lab and, and process it. It may be a situation like that. It's, it's not a situation where they just say, well, we're not coming to your town. It may be a delay, maybe a delay in response, and maybe a delay in services. But if, you know, if, if I'm not here, if I'm off at a meeting, and we get a call for a crash, the state police, they're going to show up. But eventually they'll they'll show up depending on where they are, and, and we have a great relationship with them. We have a great working relationship with them. They, they have a bunch of of great troopers, but it's it's just not the level of service that I would want to be able to provide um, to our community. There's there's a difference with somebody, a state trooper going to somebody's house that they don't know, they're not familiar with them, they're not going to. Put, they may not put the same effort in that, that we would put in. I've seen we had we had a incident where our local storage facility was broken into. 56 units were broken into. They cut the locks off of all 56 units. State police came, took a report that 56 units were broken into. So I found out about it the next day. Went over there, got information. We contacted people that had those storage units if there's anything missing. So we followed up on it. They took the initial call just so somebody responded in case there was an emergency at the time. But then they just said, okay, well, from here, we'll let Waitley handle the investigation. You know, they did, they did the initial response, but um, they're not gonna do all the, the follow-up work just because they're, they're short-staffed as well. So. I, I hear what you're saying, but to me, that, that doesn't justify more Waitley police presence because people in town are more familiar with Waitley police. I mean, if I have an incident, I don't really care whether Waitley or Deerfield or State Police come. They're going to be there to address my need. And the personal connection to me is, is kind of secondary. It's when they get there, how soon can they get there, and are they going to address my need? Whether it's you or your staff being there, I, I don't care. And I don't think to have another person there just so you can say you're there before State Police or That's before me. Deerfield is, is a justification. Uh, uh, that's not my justification. Well, you're, you're saying that police people in town would rather see that and you investigate these cases that maybe get and get resolved sooner. I don't know if sooner is always better or, so, or, or we can afford being sooner. Can we afford to do that? I mean, we've got other needs in town, staffing needs, uh, that Absolutely. we're not addressing. I mean, we're doing it gradually, but uh, we have difficulty hiring people to address all our all our town administration needs. I hear you. Uh, My responsibility is the police department, so I have right. to, I have and to that. Right, yeah, so, so I guess my question, well, first, I, I guess I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with, and I'd love to see the report and, and, and detail on it, with 600 calls a month. And I, and I only say that because we're a town of 14, 50, 15, pushing 1,500 people. That means that that if you get that means that if you're at 600, even 500, that means that there are 60. There, I'm sorry, there are 6,000 calls, 7,200 calls being made on an annual basis mm -hmm. from 1,500 people, 1,100 households, 1,000 households. Yeah. You're, you're looking at it from one end. I'm not saying calls from them calling us 
for service. So I'm saying officer initiated as well as calls, as well as 911 calls. There's there's a number of factors. A motor vehicle stop is a call. Radio oh, traffic okay. All right. yeah. is a call. Building check is a call. Yeah. Yeah. Security okay. check. Yeah. Could there be okay. a, another way to say that that's a little clearer? Because a call yeah. is a word we use in everyday life to yeah. mean someone has gotten on a phone and called you. Yeah. Understood. Okay. Yeah. So, so that for, from my perspective, it goes into the computer as a call, regardless okay. of what it is. It's or a, it gets yeah. a call number when it goes into the computer. Yeah, yeah. because you have four to five hundred. If you're not, you're not getting four to five hundred phone calls. No. You're getting so. It'd be, to me, it'd be very interesting. How many times do you actually get a phone call? Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's from 911 or from um, uh, a resident um, or you know, someone who needs you to come over. Um, to me, that would be a really relevant number. Yep, and uh, something like how many of those are either delayed or not responded to uh, or passed on to another entity like the state police. Mm -hmm. uh, that to me would be uh, a lot more relevant than this, it, it sounds like on any given patrol, you could say, oh yeah, I had 10 calls. And none of those would be particularly, uh, yeah. you know, urgent like someone actually getting on the phone and calling. Mm -hmm. So uh, if there's a way to categorize things on oh, the absolutely. system a little bit, yeah. uh, uh, a little bit better, because call sounds really urgent. Uh, stopping by because you saw a light on somewhere is, yeah. is, is a little different. Stopping, yeah. stopping someplace because you saw something. Is Which that may turn into something different, and that's why we're doing it. So right. it's, it's. I mean, I'm not saying work that officers it, are but, doing, it. but it seems yeah. like diff there's there could be a little level of differentiation. Mm -hmm. there. Oh, okay. of course, the yeah. degree. That's why I try to give a range from, you know, from an officer sitting on the side of the road doing radar to, you know, a, a serious right. call. It's, it could be anything in so between. So doing there. radar, it's a call every time you press the button. No. Regardless of whether the person's speeding. No. No, it's not a call every time. You, if I'm sitting on the side of the road for a half hour and I'm just doing traffic enforcement, that might be, that would be something that could get entered in as a call for traffic enforcement on X road. So that's a half hour that the officer's out there working, stopping cars, slowing people down, you know, maybe just talking and stopping and talking to people, give a verbal warning or just telling them to slow down or giving a citation that may turn into an arrest that may... Who knows what it's going to turn into, but that activity, mm -hmm. it's a way for us to track what officers are actually doing as well. So it's not, you come in and do your eight hour shift. If you got three 911 calls, that means you, you didn't do anything for seven hours. Well, no, we did because we did A, B, C, D, and E. So it's, it's things that officers are doing. The, the important, or an important piece of, of, of data that would, would show that is if you look in our annual town report, you get that one page of all the types of, I don't know if that's calls or incidents. Yeah, those, or are, those are breaking down the incidents. Incidents, yeah. if you compare that to prior years, I, I, I don't recall seeing a, a, a drastic increase from in the last, well, three, four, five years mm -hmm. of them kind of uh, calls or incidents that are in a town report. Yeah. I, I don't see that, so I, I don't know why there's a there's a need for more enforcement when when that's that isn't increasing that isn't showing that you have more arson calls or more more uh varsity or thefts on there i guess i i don't see that as an increase or increasing that yeah. much and and i don't want to see an increase no and that's that's why we that's why we do the proactive patrols because if you don't do the proactive patrols you're going to see an increase. Right. I guarantee we want, we've always yeah. said we want you to do the So the more you're out there, the less you're going to bring, you're going to bring down crime more. You're going to reduce things. That's the goal is to reduce it, not let it go up and say, well, yeah, we have this many calls. That's why we need somebody. I'd rather not see all of those. I'd rather take the effort to try to reduce that number even more. And that's yeah. the goal. And, and, and it, just my gut reaction is that I'd rather have a conversation about how a 20 hour a week admin would be helpful in terms of alleviating that administrative, those administrative tasks that you and the sergeant do on a regular basis and seeing if, if that would be helpful so you could devote more time to actual quote unquote traditional police work. Mm -hmm. and, and then what I guess I don't understand and I'd like to, and I don't want to get into it verbally here necessarily, but 
when you're off at a meeting, I, I, you know, whatever, because you have stuff you have to do. Is it that part-time officers are just absolutely not available? Or how, I mean, how does that, how does that work? Because I gotta believe that an officer that, ha, you know, in, in X town who has the night shift, because there are a lot of towns who have night shifts, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, they might want to pick up an extra shift here and there yeah. and, and do part-time work. So I, I guess I would like to see, A, I'd like to have a conversation about a part-time admin. Um, I, I don't think a full-time admin is necessary, but a part-time admin I, I would be interested in having a conversation about. But also, how frequently are you asking a part-time officer to fill a shift and being turned down by all those calls, and so we're we're going unfilled because you're off. And obviously, you know, Sergeant Bates has his schedule that he, you know, mm -hmm. so that's the kind of information that I would be curious about. With look, looking at the part-time officer's budget, the part-time officer's budget covers a certain number of shifts, plus it covers some time off. Not all time off, but some time off for the full-time officers. So there just isn't money in the budget to bring somebody in for the morning every time I, I go to a meeting. If we just don't have the money in the budget, we'd have to raise that portion of the budget as well. Um, so administrative, having an administrative assistant, I wouldn't be against that, but an administrative assistant gives us one, one thing that they can kind of help with. An officer gives us the ability to delegate some administrative duties as well as conduct investigative duties, calls, active, you know, going out proactive, re responding to calls, things like that. An administrative assistant, they may be sitting at the station, I may still be off at a meeting, or may still be at a training, they're sitting at the station, they can't answer a call, because they're just an administrative assistant. Right, I get so, that, I just, so yeah. Just, just, yeah, but I think that. the point, the point being more, like, if you're feeling the burden of having to do too much administrative work, that you could, it, could you offload how much of that administrative load could you offload, so to speak, onto a person who's not a police officer? Like I hear scheduling for, for um, police details, for example, um, that, that there's a, a, a number of the administrative tasks that you wouldn't need to be a highly trained police officer who knows everybody in the community to be able to do that kind of job. So, um, so I, I don't know if the right answer is 20 hours a week, but like I could also imagine that there are some administrative duties where it really actually helps to be a trained police officer. Like filling out a report on an incident, technically that's administrative work, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know that that's something that you can offload onto somebody who's not a police officer. Yeah. Um, that yeah, because of the, the training aspect of it. Yeah. So, so that's my question. Um, to kind of add on to, to uh, John bring up the, the concept of uh, having an administrative assistant. I'd really be interested in, uh, in understanding better what kind of administrative work you have that can be offloaded. Like, I don't know, I know you do a bit your own building maintenance and, and that sort of thing. And we're also yeah. kind of addressing that on a town-wide basis. But, but those are the kinds of things, like, I, I don't want a trained police officer taking out the trash. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, or cleaning the bathrooms or, yeah. or mopping the floors. You know, we, we, I think those are things that your, you know, your talents and your training really are better put to use in, hey, going to those meetings is mm -hmm. not, that's not an unimportant thing either. Uh, and I, I agree. being out in, in the community. So, so that's, I, I don't know what the right answer is for that one, but that's something that'd be good to know about. I guess to, to follow up on what we're talking about, the administrative stuff, uh, I guess I like to see some data of surrounding communities that you mentioned in here, well, for one, that have, I guess, more than two police officers, and I guess I'm not really interested, or I think we're not in Greenfield or Northfield or maybe Deerfield, but these other towns that are the same size as Whateley, you know, the population or mileage or whatever you want to, you want to call it, how many police officers do they have full time? And is like we're asking, is anybody doing their administrative work? Are they passing it on to, they have somebody on staff or is it passing it on to town administration? I guess I like to see some data. The, the majority 
the majority of it, looking at Franklin County and the surrounding towns, I can I can tell you Sunderland has an administrative assistant. Deerfield has a full-time administrative assistant. Well, you've got five people in Deerfield, so I guess. Yeah, but you're you're asking about administrative assistants. Right. Those so are the only ones that I know yeah, of. Yeah, those, those counts are obviously bigger. Right. And those are the only ones I know of that have an administrative assistant. The rest of them don't. Right. No, they're sort of they the biggest of assistants. the towns that you mentioned. And how many do all of them have? Three police officers? It's full time that you mentioned. Just the ones, the ones that I listed in there. Yeah. Yeah. So you're saying Deerfield has three? I think they have more than three. Yeah, more than that, yeah. Full time. Deerfield has two people, twenty four seven. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sunderland has how many full time? They have five full time officers. Hatfield. Hatfield has three. Williamsburg. Williamsburg is slotted for three. They haven't built three slots, but um, Shelburne. Shelburne has three. Irving. Irving has five. They're looking for a sixth. Bernardston. Bernardston, three. Northfield. Northfield has two currently, and I think they're looking for a third. And Shootsbury? Shootsbury's in, in a big transition right now. I think they're still working on finding their, their full time chief. Yeah. Um, but they have, there. currently, they have two positions. Yeah. Two full time positions. It'd be positions. interesting to look at the, the list that the personnel committee. Um, uh, identified of towns that are similar to us in in other ways yeah. and see how many full-time the other question would be um, there's you know you, have, you said you have a budget for part-time mm -hmm. um, and wrote how many full-time equivalents do we have in terms of part-time people like, uh, like do we have how many hours a week are we um, tending roughly 40 40. So we have. Yeah, they a, cover all the shifts on the weekends. So one other sort of full time equivalent, but it's really a job broken down among part time officers. Uh, up, up among yeah. part time officers. And which, I mean, we could, we could talk about the next component as well, which is the change in the Municipal Police Training Committee. There's, there's been some changing, and there, there's going to be some, some major changes coming down the road as far as um, training requirements. They're talking either this year or next year requiring the police officer, the full-time academy to be 720 hours and the part-time academy is going to be 700 hours. Um, so to, to send enough. Did you say 720 and 700? Correct. A difference of 20 hours? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's right. the same thing that's going through my head, the confusion. Um, okay. There's a big push because there's a police officer standardized training. It's the post um, program that's used mostly nationwide. Most, most departments use that. Um, if you split up Massachusetts into, into halves, just like anything else out here in Western Mass, they can't figure out how, in Eastern Mass, they can't figure out how we put a part-time officer out on the street by themselves without the full-time academy. They're, they can't figure it out. They're pushing to, to get rid of that. So it's you have to have full-time. Driven by the LAs of Eastern as opposed to Western Massachusetts. That's, yeah, yeah uh, you know. But it's, it's going to be dictated by the Municipal Police Training Committee. If there's only one academy, we have to follow that standard. Right. We're going to have to have full-time officers. All of, all of our part-time officers, you know, they're, they're not going to be able to, to meet that same standard. So we're going to have to use full-time officers. <clears throat> so that's, that's changing. That's coming down the road. I've, I've taught at the last two academy classes um, probably a total of 80 80 officers, potential officers, and the consensus that I got from them is that if it was a 700 hour class costing them twice as much, not one of them raised their hand saying they would be in that room taking that class. So it's, it's gonna cause, if they don't mandate full-time officers, it's gonna cause a shortage of part-time officers. And part-time officers change, they come and they go, and it's getting harder and harder to find them. <clears throat> okay, to let's work those ships. To, let's, let's finish this up pretty soon. Though. Okay, right right now, okay, you're there four days a week from, from what, six to four? What is your shift? Um, my normal shift is seven to five. Seven to five, and yep. your sergeant comes on? He he works three to, three to 11, three currently. Three to 11, he's five days, you're only four days, yep. right? And so what, if, if we went, we'd hire another person full time, what would their hours be? Um, well, it's it's, I'm looking at it as kind of not flex time, so to speak, but flexible schedule. So if it may be a day where they come in 
a certain time one day, they come in later and stay later. So if there's an overlap, they may work the same same hours as me. It may be a, an eight to five type of thing on Monday through Friday, or it may be a seven to three, or maybe something to that effect. So we haven't we haven't figured out the actual schedule. What what's probably going to work best for us um, would be another five day a week person, but it's still forty hours. It wouldn't be a full. So I would be I would come in earlier than them. They would stay later than than me. Okay. Is 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 another option here? Not not saying that we decided on this one you're proposing, but uh, kind of related to scheduling if. If you thought of, a, if you had another full-time person that they would come say, uh, work Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and you wouldn't have to hire the part-timers on a weekend, how is that compared to your budget? If you'd have overlap with you and your other staff for two days of the week, two out of the mm -hmm. four, and you'd have the weekends covered full-time, well, for eight, eight, part of it, one, the eight hour one shift, shift, one shift, yeah. how is that? Effect and affect your budget here. Have you looked at it that way? I, I, not the, the effect of, that it would have on the budget, but well, I think it would be better concerns. served. I think it would be better served having that person available during the week as opposed to working on the weekends. But they would be there on two days or overlap two days with you or, or the your three days with your sergeant. Uh, plus, I assume they would have the expertise to do all the investigation and crime scene stuff that, I don't know if that is what occurs on the weekends and during the week or, or, or what? It's not, it's not something they automatically are certified in. I mean, it would, it no, would require but I mean, but that, a great deal of training. But, but how would that affect your, your, your budget here if you looked at a scenario like that? I, I haven't analyzed it as far as a, a budget effect. I'm just, I'm looking at it from the, the coverage perspective. Well, and, and being able to utilize somebody, an additional officer during the week, because that's the, the majority of the time when administrative stuff is happening, when the meetings are happening, when all that stuff's going on. So the weekends, that's why we have part-time officers covering the weekends, yeah, because there's no other, no other responsibility. They're not going to get yeah. called to a meeting or... But it, yeah, but if a full-time officer were covering two weekend days, mm -hmm. then there's still three days of overlap during your high administrative time. Um, and it, it, if if it is in fact necessary for a trained police officer to be doing administrative work, um, so yeah, I, I wrote down to something here as well about I, I would find it really hard to to just recommend a third full time officer in the absence of in the absence of reducing the number part time. That would, to, to me, that it, it doesn't make that much sense otherwise. Um, I also think, I mean, we have to do this very thoughtfully, and I, I, I agree that we should think about how to how to offload some of the administrative work that can be offloaded, um, because it's not cost effective to have a trained professional to not you know, charge. charge. I don't mean. I was about to say something that would make it sound like I don't think administrators are professional, but a trained professional policeman doesn't um, isn't required to do uh, good professional administrative work. That's th 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 those to me are the two uh, big things that stick out. Also, in the, in the towns where you say they have three officers, um, it'd be very interesting to know what do they have for part-time officers as well? Because that's sort of the whole the, uh, coverage question. Yeah. Um, yeah six to eight officers is the average across the, you know, any, any one of those that you Right. That you but you know, we are, we are a smaller town mm -hmm. uh, among the ones that you've mentioned. We're among the yeah. smallest of the towns. And yeah, and not, we, if, if we have eight part-time officers, that doesn't mean that eight part-time officers are working every week. We have so many because not everybody can work every week. Of course, of course, right. So, right, right. so, so, but you yeah, so we have a bigger pool to, to pull from. Three full-time people at this point, approximately. If we count all the part-time because they're 40 mm -hmm. hours, we have effectively three full-time equivalent police officers in the town. Yeah. About 1,500. That puts us very favorably with the, the ratio that you mentioned in your uh, in your email, an, uh, an additional officer would 
would be kind of uh, substantially over that, and you'd need a really good reason for why that would be the case um, in a place like Whaley, too. I, I think I'm hearing the reservations of people up here about a full-time officer, I, but I, I do think I'm also hearing that to alleviate the administrative challenges, um, you know, as a as an iterative step to to look into a part-time admin. I don't think we need a full-time admin, I and mean, that's what that's what a town like Deerfield has. We're not we're not Deerfield, um, and if that is something that you're interested in to help you with your because because I want my, personally I want our police chief out there. I don't want our police chief doing administrative work. I want them out there. People and people out there, people in the community want to see you. Yeah, there's no question. So I'm I would love to entertain that conversation and and maybe we can make it a part of this budget. Um, that's that's my feeling. We're gonna stop because we're gonna go. We're starting to go around in circles a little bit. Um, yeah. But should should we ask first? And, and what should we ask for from Jim for if we're not deciding say today? For more information for another meeting, I think let's be specific what we want, so we don't rehash the same stuff next time. I, I think the logs would be important. You know, the I keep hearing B and E's, but at a high, a B and E was 11, 12 times. Um, I, I want to see more detailed logs of so that we can look at data as opposed to listening okay. to anecdotes. Is somebody writing this down to maybe it. Okay, and then then, then and then also okay. I, I think to see to Joyce's point about administrative work that can be done by a professional admin as opposed to administrative work that really needs to be done by a trained police officer because you, you need to know what you're talking about mm -hmm. in a report or whatever it is. I think that would be interesting information and, and not just, again, that wouldn't be just anecdotal. That would be actual detailed reports of what administrative tasks are performed on a weekly basis and of those, who, why do X percent of those reports need to be a trained officer and why? Not just, yes, X needs to be a trained officer. Okay, but why does that so that we can make an informed decision um, but given the time I mean the calendar I mean, again I, I'm gonna encourage you to think about that part-time admin as a start because I, I don't think we have enough information here to especially when warrants are due you know in the next month okay. and the other thing you know and Joyce we mentioned comparing other towns let's try let's yeah. look at the ten towns that they've identified for salary purposes. Yeah. And not just full-time well, officers, but full-time plus a number of hours of part-time officers. Okay. Would be, um, that would be, those would be very uh, substantial numbers to, you know, to build an argument on. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. We gotta move on. Thanks, Jim. Yep. Yeah. Um, Brian, let's go to the mass development thing quickly. Yeah. Um, Fred's seen a bit of this. Mass Development has a technical assistance grant that is out there that would potentially help the town of Waitley figure out what it wants to do or what it can do with actual data as opposed to a, a, a gut check conversation that we could have with three of us um, with yeah. <coughs> open property. Um, and, and I actually think it's a good idea to, to, to look at possibilities at both the center school and the DeMeo property. Um, because without someone really helping us yeah. understand the potential, I think we're spinning our wheels. Yeah. Isn't this just a property? I, I mean, well, I mean. No, it's both. It's, it's, an, it's open ended. And, and I guess I would like the board to be okay with our board and Brian and Amy submitting on our, on our behalf, submitting so that we get it in under the deadline and we get, up, we get pushed up on the queue in terms of getting accepted. And then we can determine whether we say thank you, yes, we'll accept, or no, we're gonna pass at this point. But if we don't get it in on time, then 
we are potentially punting an opportunity. It is a reimbursement grant in terms of math development would want their money they invested in this program back if we were to gain revenue from it. Brian, have you found out whether they want their money back even if they don't, even if we don't gain revenue from it? No, it, it only sells if, oh, what we were talking about specifically. Yeah. No, I don't really, I don't know the distinction between And we can find that out, but, but again, if we don't submit by Friday, it may not be a lost opportunity, but it might be a lost opportunity, and it's a, it's a cookie cutter application, so why not submit? I don't think there's a downside to submitting. Well, uh, two, two things, a couple of things come, come to mind. Uh, as you've seen in some of the emails, this has not come from, this does not come from the housing committee. No. This comes from one individual in town. No. Right. Uh, so there's no input. Uh, housing committee came to this board a year and a half ago and said that there was no interest in, in Developing these properties in town for for, how, right. for housing. Okay, so so the housing right. committee has made a and, statement. And and Fred, to, to your point, remove housing from the thought process. Right. This okay. is just so that we, as a select board, is responsible for these two properties and the, and their eventual uh, outcomes. Okay, but what? Why do we need to tell? A developer, either what's wrong with the bill with the property, or I, I, I guess I, I don't see the, the benefit, you know, looking back, you know, the Blue School Frontier advertised without saying what the uses were. And we got a developer that told us what he wanted to do with it. Uh, and he investigated and, and figured out whether it was reasonable and profitable for him to do that. I think for, for these properties in, in town, these other properties that we should just see what developers come up with. You know, planning is, is looking at involving historic uh, commission and changing the, the bylaws to allow certain kinds of developments that otherwise probably wouldn't happen there. Uh, Why don't we want professional assistance? I, I, don't, I don't see what we're gonna, we're gonna gain. You're gonna come up with a report, wait a minute, that says that, you know, all these deficiencies exist on this property or you can only build this well, I don't know if you can say that. Can you build this kind of a building or this kind of use there? Because you've got planning involved, you've got a zoning bylaws that are also involved. I don't see what we're going to gain by this other than, other than delaying the process to sell the building, say the center school. I mean, if we go through this, I don't know how soon they're talking you're going to, you're going to do, get any results from this process. Uh, which may mean you're going to go through another heating season, another season of ten thousand dollars to maintain the building, like we discussed at the last meeting. I, I, yeah. I, I don't, I don't see us gaining that much. And you know, when people buy property, when you buy a house, you do your own. The buyer, the buyer does the assessment of the building. What do you call it? The home inspection, not the seller. The seller isn't going to hire somebody to to give you a report of what's wrong with your house and what needs to be done. It's the buyer. And whoever the buyer is for these properties, it's up to them to figure out what, what, what is wrong with the property, what needs to be done, or whether it can be developed to meet their needs. But we, uh, but we as a town, Fred, don't know uh, what we want to do with those properties yet. We don't know whether we want yeah. to keep it so, so or, or right. sell it. Or okay, so, so can I jump, because yeah. when I read this, I have no idea what product we would get back yeah. mm. from this. Like, are they going to help us figure? Because to me, that is the bigger question at the center school. It is not obvious to me at all that we should have a developer come in and make a bid to do something there. We don't know. Like, right. We don't really yeah. know what we want to do with it. And it, this did not strike me necessarily as a group that's going to help us figure out what we could do. It seemed to be biased towards well, if you're going to develop that real estate for profit. Whereas we haven't really taken off the table uh, other municipal uses, right. like having a park or having other things in town that would that would also contribute to economic development in the in the town, but not directly as a as a piggy bank or, and, or a money and, taker. And I guess 
my argument is simple, because of all those unknowns that you just mentioned, Joyce, mm -hmm. until we have, and Mass Development is a, is a quasi-public agency. They're not, yeah. they're, they're, they're there to help municipalities figure out what they don't know. And until we have data knowing what's possible and what's not possible, we can't answer some of the questions about do we want it to be a park, do we want it to be X, because we don't know what the opportunity cost is. We don't know what we're missing out on. And, and I think that, uh, that bringing on board professional planners, for lack of a better term, who really can help us answer these questions so we know what we have or what we don't have I think we're just going to continue to spin our wheels. I mean, the, the DeMeo property is the perfect example of it. It sat there for years. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so the grant would be to get information about what do you see as a possible way to develop, where develop is a very broad word and does not necessarily mean um, putting in housing, right, or putting right. in businesses, or putting in something, or selling the building, or selling the property. Exactly. Use it in the broadest definition possible, the word develop. What do we want the end use of this property to be? And I think actually, Fred, all the things that Joyce said, I think it would, be, it, it would help us with the needed kick in the pants to expedite it. Because it's, without the information, it's too easy to say, we don't know, so we're gonna kick the can down the road. I think this will help us expedite the process. Let's not kid ourselves. Nothing's going to happen tomorrow. We yeah. know that. Right. Because again, we don't know what we what we want to do or what we can do with the, with the town. The only cost would be, and Brian will, Brian will find this out, and again, we can submit, and if we choose to say thanks but no thanks, we can, but the only cost to the town would be if we generate revenue, they would get a percentage of that revenue back. And so, I, and I guess my only point is, let's support submission so we keep all of our options open. There's no downside to submitting. Because you're not committing to anything. Well, other than we're possibly delaying the Sale of I, the I, I don't yes. think we're de delaying that. I don't well, think I don't we know have how any soon. idea. Yeah, we have no. Well, you have no idea when you're going to get results from this. Uh, the, 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 other, the other option that I see happening in, in surrounding towns is there's they've issued an RFP. It's either Hadley or Amherst issued an RFP for a building they wanted to to put on the market for development. They issued an RFP for realtors and anybody that was interested in helping them sell this building and they hired a uh, I, I think it came down to a real estate company that was into that kind of development and is working to sell them and I don't I don't know what the, it was just a commission they were getting on it or the the, the RFP uh, advertisement did not say a compensation for the person doing it but uh, they hired a, a, a real estate agent to market and sell the building and come up with a with a buyer. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, uh, but that would be fine if we actually knew that we want to sell the building and the parcel. We don't know that. Okay, this but is, is this gonna gonna tell you that? It will uh, help us I, I don't, gain information. I, yeah, to me it wasn't clear from reading this, but from what John has said, I think that yes, we you know if we write the grant asking them if they would please help us figure out what to do with this um, using development in the largest terms, not just selling of the property, then I think we might get some, some valuable information from having a different set of eyes look at the problem. And right now we're not looking at the problem, we're, 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 we got really stuck in the mud, Fred. And, and, and you know what, and, and in all honesty, if we submit, because we don't know when this would come to fruition, you're right. If we submit this on Friday morning, and next Wednesday morning, someone comes to the town of Waitland and says, I'm gonna give you a million dollars for that property right now. Okay, well, we don't know whether we wanna sell it, but we at least know that we've got an offer, so we start to gain it. It doesn't preclude us from do anything, doing anything in the interim. It just keeps all of the potential cards in our hand. 
Is that, am I, am I doing an accurate portrayal, Brian? Because tell me if I'm not, that's fine. I, I believe that's the services that they're offering. Um, my understanding is that it's probably geared a little bit more towards private development, but I don't know that's exclusively what they do. Um, but they may tell us that there's not a market for it, so that would help answer, sort of, or help mm -hmm. us lead us in the, in, in the right direction. You know, the, the can only we ask them to do the, to to give opinions on things other than private development? Because I, I I I did sort of smell private development here. I, but I think that's it wasn't true. really necessarily spelled out. Right, and I, but I don't think if we, if we ultimately decided we didn't want to do, go in that direction, mm -hmm. they can't okay, hold okay. our feet to the fire. Okay. Is, 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 Brian, is, are we able to submit something by Friday? Yeah. It's a very basic. Uh, it's a very basic okay. online application. It's a little confusing. In the one paragraph about the, the schedule here, the times, it says with the earliest project starting in July 2019. Does that mean their project would start in July, or yeah, that's when we would, we, the assistance we receive would begin in July 2019. Begin in July if we were accepted. If, if we were accepted, accepted. okay. But Which is pretty it, good. It also says later. Right, no but it, it, depending on their workload. Right, but it also said that the that the later you submit, the the mm -hmm. lower you are down on the queue. So I, I just think again, it's keeping our options okay. open. We and it's and an it, easy lift. I'll even help Brian and Amy do it. And is the what we're asking for what ten thousand? Is that a reasonable amount, Brian? What do you feel? I, I know that I don't have the application here. I, I'd have to look. I'd have to but, look at the scope of work when we get it down to see. To see. But it also calls for a what a town committee or something to get involved, doesn't it? Yeah, there would there would be involvement from the various stakeholders yeah. coming. Stakeholders, yeah. We'd, okay. want, we'd want some from the historic commission. We'd want some from the select board. Uh, we could okay. go on our planning board. Um, Whoever else has a stake in the, mm -hmm. the use of the school. So, so I think the application so far was was written just towards the center school. No, I think you have to submit two separate applications. That's that's my sense. If For the two different properties, I would think so. And I mean, I make, it just makes more sense, but it's good. Yeah. Yeah. I think those are kind of the two properties that we know the least about what we want to do with them. We, we kind of know that we had listed the demise property for oh on and off over the years and I don't think ever gotten one sort of lukewarm bite from somebody who said well maybe in five years I want to put a, 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 a spa and pool yeah. supply store there. That was and that was probably seven eight years ago. That was a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, so I you know, th nobody's clamoring to put up their business there. Yeah. So, right, but, but, but maybe we're not doing it. Maybe we yeah. don't have a sense of what. Yeah, Someone's going to say, this is the kind of business that's going to be there, and this is the kind of business that's not going to be there. Well, yeah. that was even advertised before zone, rezoned to commercial, so. Yeah. I don't know if now so, they're limiting that even further. I, I got to go to a CPC meeting. Um, okay. And you guys can, but I would like to make a motion that we uh, submit this grant by this application by Friday, by the Friday deadline. And then we can figure it out later. We meaning Brian. We meaning Brian. And I and I told him I'd, I'd help him and, yeah. do a little bit. I got time. If he wants my help, he may not he may be like I know. Do we need a motion? I, I think I think I think Brian would feel more comfortable if we had the support of the select board. So I'd make a motion. Um, second. Yeah we may also need a letter from the uh, chairperson. Yeah, that's fine. I'm around. Okay. All those in favor? Okay. Good. Thank you. I apologize, but I do have a CPC that's talking okay. about some of this stuff. So. All right. I think we'll 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 figure out the trench safety policy. Madam Vice Chair. Didn't we talk about that years ago, Joyce? Yeah. Uh, it was a, it's a different well, trench safety policy. Years ago, yeah. Yeah. And then okay. the personnel committee. You can keep me posted. All that. There's more of a cost to that than uh, there's there's more of a cost to that CPC proposal than just because it's 
if, if, if the highway superintendent accepts these responsibilities, what will he not be doing any longer because he is full time? So, would you like us to discuss that on the 26th? Well, we can, we can discuss you guys. it at both, but that's okay. Yeah, you know, thank you. We can talk about anything you want, including John. Now that he's mm -hmm. gone, yes, but that would be unprofessional. Um, but let's just start knocking these out from um, top to bottom, top to bottom. All right, okay. Uh, trench safety policy. So, as, as you'll recall, municipalities are subject to OSHA requirements now. Um, so, one of the requirements under OSHA is that um, we have a trench safety program. And this is, so what's happened is the uh, Department of Labor Standards, which is the enforcement agency, has started putting a number of different templates and model policies that towns can adopt mm -hmm. for um, compliance. So we can, we can imagine we'll probably, like, if we're not seeing these start streaming through, then you guys should start asking why we're not seeing policies like this streaming through. Um, but this is their, this is their uh, template policy, and it's a policy that we need to have in place before we can buy the trench box that we have a small grant from Maya uh -huh. to purchase one of their, one of the pre, prerequisites to us mm -hmm. purchasing the trench box for the money is that we have a, a trench safety program in place. Um, okay. I asked Keith to review this and he did and he didn't said he didn't see any problems with it. And this the trench box, I don't remember is that something that is referred to here? Because I don't remember seeing it. Does talk about it. Yeah. Okay. And I must have so okay, so trench box is something that you would use to help implement this. Now they seem to use the word program and policy interchangeably. Is that? I believe so, yeah. Okay. So I think, pol yeah, policy. Because like programming, think of something as a start date and an end date, but this is really a policy. That well, I think they doesn't might. have a, it's, it's an open-ended, it would be enforced until we change it to something else. Right. Right, okay. So there's no permit or anything required for this? Uh, just a, a policy that contractor would have to follow this this is the town right. of Waitley's trench the safety town, program the, the town it's, I don't think it it applies necessarily to a private contractor we're only responsible for our own ocean compliance oh, this so is only for us so oh, you, okay. private yeah. your private excavators should have something very similar that would comply with ocean right. yeah oh, okay. and then we do have sort of a trench oh. permit does this <clears throat> change yeah. what is right. in our I remember approving that um, there was after the, the state was asking towns to do that, or, or maybe requiring towns to do that. And this is long enough ago that I'm fuzzy on the details, but I think uh, like a child had been you know, hurt or injured, he falling into a trench. The town does have a trench. The highway the highway department does have something called a trench permit. Yeah. That that somebody would apply for, yeah. and that's that's when you open up a essentially when you're opening up something in the public right of way. Yeah. A uh, private contractor wants to open up something in the public right away. Um, yeah. But that's... That's not, not related to this necessarily. It's not necessarily related to it, right? So this would apply to our water department as well? Um, we are going to... I'm going to suggest to the water commissioners that they would adopt this as well. Okay. Um, I don't know if they need to, but it doesn't hurt. Yeah. Okay. The, the one item I, I didn't know about, it, but Keith doesn't feel it's an issue. Identifying the soil types, they got type A, B, and C. And there's no discussion or reference. What is type C? So, uh, and it it deter that affects uh, your slope. Right. So there's a requirement um, that we have a competent a competent person. Um, who's trained in soil testing, cave and protective systems, and hazardous and hazard identifications? Um, Keith and uh, Keith and Wayne are both scheduled to attend a training okay. um, in South Deerfield. I believe it's at the end of the month or early next month. Um, and you'll that's where they'll receive those training, and they'll be certified as competent persons so that we can dig trenches. 
Um, but it has to do with soil stability. Right, it does. Um, a is the most stable soil in which to excavate. Type C is the least stable soil. Right. So you can assume that the policy is 4.0. Allows you to assume that it's the least stable. No. So, and so you just you use that use as your maximum protections in terms of what your sloping on the edges are. Um, so, yeah. if the competent person is not comfortable with identifying yeah. what the soil is, then you just assume it's C, and then you need to have a different slope on your your trench sides. I, I love the references to the competent person. <laughs> Capital C, competent person. Yeah. <laughs> they, we 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 thought it was a, a direct translation, but years ago when we were getting a visa to go live in Japan for a few years. They told the return letter said take these forms to the competent official at the Japanese consulate in Boston. And so we didn't ask when we got there who were the competent ones, but it was, it reminded me of that. So I would uh, move that we adopt uh, this trench safety policy. Okay, sir. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, there's a seasonal liquor license uh, for Quanquan Farm, renewing the liquor license they get every year. Yep. So the seasonal license is that something we need to approve before the end of March. Okay. Uh, so Quanquan has applied yeah, there been, for their same. There been lots of police incidents there? I haven't heard of any, but okay. maybe it's the person to know. I guess we should have asked them before we left, but... Yeah. I, I have not heard of any... Uh, I have good. not heard of alcohol-related incidents, um, or incidents really of any kind, so, other than people having a good time. Can this go to you or to Amy? I can say. All right. Um, Outdoor Recreation Trail Network. So I, I called Paul yesterday and he's he's going to come at the next meeting. Okay. Paul, that was Paul Newland and... Uh, I forget who else it was. Okay. Gabe. Oh, okay. Peter. Peter Kriske? Peter. The Poplar Hill Road folks. Could be. Okay. Anyways, Paul Newland and some other individuals. I apologize, but I can't remember the name. Okay. All right, so that's going to be our next meeting. Yes. She's got a full Okay, so discuss and review general government budgets. Um, let me pull those up here. So there's two main budgets that. Yeah. Um, I think it's good that we talk about it. One of those is the Select Board and Administration budget. And then the other one is the, the town buildings operation, but town building operations budget. Um, yeah. And at this point, because there's been no call or any adjustments to salaries, the show, mm -hmm. salaries right now show show that they're the same. Um, and then under the general expenses line item, mileages and meetings, I'm suggesting that could work. Um, this is on the, the page that oh. says GG1? GG1, yep, yeah. for the detailed budget. Mm -hmm. um, a small $300 increase for advertising. What's happening, mm -hmm. I think, is that they are, there are things that we advertise for that come before the select board that are, and this may be something we should look at, but that, that are not reimbursed. Um, oh. So. When you say advertising, like advertising, well, like legal advertising, advertising, things like legal, that. Legal notices. Um, so, you know, we spent just over almost $1,300 in you know, 2018. So I suggest okay. we bump that up just a little bit. And then mileage and meetings, um, that seems to be creeping up too. Um, I think we have more people attending meetings and workshops, mm -hmm. more people meeting myself and select board members. Um, and from what I can tell, I think that was, that was like two I years. Good. Yeah. Two yeah. years in a row, it was much closer to a thousand than it was to the seven fifty. So that seems yeah reasonable. And I, I, I it just seems that every day things get more complicated and there's more regulations and more updates and there's just new things that we need to learn each year. Mm -hmm. 
this year's, you know, this year and last year was recreational marijuana and short-term rentals, and uh, next year, I'm, mm -hmm. who knows what it's going to be, but yeah. uh, things keep Maybe changing. It'll cost us a heck of a lot more if we don't find out about it, right? Could. So, so, I know later on there's something where postage is kind of gathered together. So yeah, why, why is there still going to be like a little separate? So uh, like why isn't why don't we just like get rid of it move all? that whole thing over to the? Other I guess thing? I was thinking there's so for most things we'll use we use our postage meter that we got that we started leasing, but I think there's going to be when we send and I'll I'll double check this with Lynn, but there's going to be times where we're going to need to buy stamps. There's going to be times when we need to go to the post office and pay oh. postage. Oh. So, I mean, my thinking was, and may, maybe I should, maybe I should rethink it. But the the postage that was in the town buildings would have been just for the postage meter. Mm -hmm. That's money that we put onto the meter, or right. we, we pay for the we pay to the meter. Um, it's the first year. Well, when did we get the we got the meter last fall? So, um, we're still we're trying. And has that been saving saving money? I believe so. It's a reduced. It's a reduced rate. It's a reduced rate. But when Lynn sends out tax bills and all that, is that is that postage on here? Or is that coming? Is that on here or is that somewhere else? That's that's well, she, that was moved over to here. She she so I'm I'm talking about the town building operations one now. Yeah. Um, oh, next page, okay. Yeah. We, ideally what ideally what would happen is and once we get a year we'll have a better idea of what those costs will be. I think she sent out one series of, mm -hmm. of tax bills. Um, we'll have a better idea of exactly what those costs will be. Um, lost my train of thought, but yeah, ideally, with oh, so ideally we'll have most of the postage will be carried into town building operations with less and less mm -hmm. with the various like, boards on the board and mm. all of those. Oh, okay. those Okay. So there's there's some benefit to having a little bit of flexibility that not everything has to go right. through the postage meter. Yep. And it may, be that hundreds, it may be that a hundred's too high, but... Yeah. And um, how often do we have to use things like FedEx or UPS for, um, for like, really time-sensitive um, delivery? It all depends. <laughs> yeah, it depends on what we're doing. But typically... Um, Generally, not very often. From what I send, not all that often. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I, I don't know what, what it sends out. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But we're still trying to feel our way through. A lot of work. Yeah. So, um, oh, are we still on that page? Which one's that? The uh, GG6. The, GG6. Know, the, the town building. Yeah, I can run through it a little bit if you want. Because you can ask me about why is there a seven thousand dollar increase in electricity? Did you did you see I made this little arrow? I, I marked this before the meeting. I marked it too when I did it. Right, because it, I mean it was, seemed like it was between appropriated, expended, appropriated, expended. We never actually got up to the fifteen thousand yep. dollar mark. So there must be a good reason for it, or you wouldn't have done it. There is. Okay. So, and. It's, so we have five months of electricity usage at the town hall with the new building. Uh -huh. We average around seven hundred dollars a month with the operation okay. of the base place. So that's eighty four hundred dollars. Oh, okay. Electricity. So it was the winter, so it's the the tougher months. Yep. For the mini splits. Yeah. So maybe so I didn't include so I didn't add eighty four thousand to what to what we had approved here. I saw there was some excess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had a little bit to play with, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, again, once we have a, a full once year. we have a full year on that on that building, that'll be that'll be easier. Um, but that's that's the impetus for that increase. Well, now we know the target for how much we want to get uh, from people who rent the spaces. <laughs> <laughs> just a, just a little. Yeah. Chilly. You know, if, if we're, that's one of the, the biggest items on this sheet for our, our operations. The yeah. 20,000, 22,000, and, and if you're just looking at, that's just electricity, not fuel oil, 
electricity costs, you, you add what other town departments have, and, and especially the school and the water department, you're, you're probably approaching forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 in electricity costs. Mm -hmm. And that's one of my... I think we're there. Yeah, one of my those numbers, but I don't concerns is, is, is we should be getting serious about solar for town uses yeah. either. Well, since the last time you and I, either we had a meeting, yeah. I've actually uh, done a little bit of work on that. That's and um, you've read in the newspapers, Eversource touting how much solar they're putting yeah. out there right. without actually mentioning in the same article how many solar projects they have uh, yeah. effectively killed okay. with their hookup fees. Okay. Um, look at yesterday's, uh, or maybe it was today's, yesterday's uh, letter to the editor and the reporter, a recorder, someone named Aaron Thalbel, who I, I know I've met him before. He mm -hmm. and I were at the uh, uh, shares at the same CSA in Sunderland, um, brought this <laughs> to the attention of readers that, that Eversource is is killing solar projects. Uh, they were going to put 50 meg on the uh, on the roof of the biodiesel plant. That uh, it was killed with a half a million dollar hookup fee. Wendell just got killed by I can't remember how big there's but hundreds of thousands of dollars of hookup fee. Uh, Sunderland did get an array put in, but they had originally planned something a lot bigger than that, um, and uh, they had to modify it in, in order to be able to get. Their, their hookup fee done. I am planning myself to go to the listening session on Friday at the Jones Library. Anybody else want to come? Um, our state rep will be there, our uh, state senator will be there, and then a couple of other state reps will be there as well. Um, and I just want to light a fire under people because, um, they, I mean, there, it used to be that you could get solar projects uh, through with reasonable hookup fees. But when Eversource bought Lamico, this is secondhand information, so this could be some details are, are not uh, uh, correct. That basically the decision making went from the Western Mass office to Boston. And Boston just decided, well, we're not making money off of that, so let's blow up these projects with really big hookup fees. So, um, so at this point, we've identified that as the main risk in trying to go forward with the solar project. It doesn't mean you don't go forward. There are ways to get the upfront costs uh, financed, which was really heartening and that it's actually been done for nonprofits that were not municipalities, but there's no reason legally why it can't be applied to municipalities. Um, so that's something that I personally have gone out and looked into. It will take a little while to figure out whether it's something that we can do, but uh, Brian has helped with uh, kind of sorting out what town lands might be available, um, which ones might have swamp problems. Um, and then, of course, I think you know, we, we, I think we should cover at least some part of the parking lot so people can have shady places to park in the summer. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, so the, the, basically, we're we're trying to do some of the preliminary work, um, but we've really got to get people you know, calling and writing their legislators to be outraged about how the electricity company is uh, is behaving and uh, not letting us put up. Things that will help our town. This, I you know? read in, in a paper, Bernard's done it just to prove something. Some 18 acres behind a four leaf clover. Right, did they get their hookup fee yet? I, I don't know. <laughs> yes, that, so. Uh, I, so it may it, or may not happen. If uh, I don't think it mentioned that word at all. Yeah, <laughs> so there's pro they are probably not to that point yet. Okay, I'm just yeah. curious if they get successful in hookup fee or not. But. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's, um, um, and, and, and there's, there's all, it's, their lobbyists did a really good job on this last energy bill that the state passed. That's and I, you know, how many times I wrote to Stan and Steve about that, but they still let it go. They just the, the lobbyists are really powerful. So I guess that was my rant okay. for the day. All right, if I do another rant, you may cut me off. Okay, well it's good that you're <laughs> yeah. staying involved in that and trying to help us. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. And then we were in the middle of general government budgets. Okay. So we have to turn it back over to Brian to uh, to pull out what he what you'd like to point out to us. Yep. So okay. there was lines for copier lease and what used to be called copier supplies. The copier lease was never four thousand dollars. The new one we're entering into 
is you know that's that's the cost for the for the copy release. Um, in that, I think for the copy release there was maintenance agreements that were included probably in that prior cost, but we pulled those back to copy maintenance agreement and supplies. Um, so there's only about a five hundred dollar difference there, and I think for the first time we're hoping to go to uh, can hold your breath, but a color copier. <gasps> I know that's. Well, so they can be pretty costly with the ink. Yeah. Right. So, so sure. I think but we will use it very really sparingly. Be very scroogey about it. And it's color. default black and white. So if you hit the if you hit the button, um, but just for small things, it's it would be nice to yeah. maps and things like that to, to be able right. to print. So colors. you're saying that the the minus seventeen hundred and the plus. 2200 are sort of canceling each other out. It's about, there's about a $500 increase yeah. there. Is, is there it, my math right. They're all, yeah, they're almost canceling each other out. The only copy release is the one in the hallway here? No, that one we own outright. We own outright. So where is this one that we? The one in the back. Or in that the That lease is up. Oh, okay. Yep. And have we thought of buying one similar to this one out in the hallway? Um, it's typically, we've we had discussions in here, but it's typically better to what we found is it's better release. Better release, okay. Yeah. Um, we talked about the, the 7,000. Uh, we're trying to consolidate the postage line or at least some of the postage line items there. Um, like I said, we had, the, we had the postage meters since late last fall, early winter. Um, so we're seeing, and that gives us a reduced rate for any time we um, yeah. do that. Um, there's yeah. money to get the septic tank pump because I don't think it's, well, we'll have to double check that, but I don't think it's been done for a while. Um, the, se the septic tank here? Yeah. Um, what was expended in 2017 then? Um, that was, one of those was for Town Hall. Um, Town Hall. Oh, okay. I believe, yeah. Probably, yeah. Okay, so, it so was, basically it was some, there's, no. there's going to be some building that needs a septic pump in any given year in all I mean. So yes, budgeting one per year is not yeah. extraordinary. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if you want to do anything <laughs> with the center school septic. I mean, it, so mm -hmm. there's septics here, um, town hall and center mm -hmm. school. Oh, okay. That I think that money would be applicable for. Um, the internet and VoIP, I, I think that's, I think 4,500 is an accurate number. We have two internet connections. We have the internet connection here. Mm -hmm. We have the internet connection at the town hall. Mm -hmm. And then we have the, the voice over IP system that's through Crocker Communications. So if I do the math, it's about, it's about that amount. It's about, mm -hmm. you know, 40, 43, mm -hmm. $1,400 for that. Um, and then flags, um, you'd be surprised how quickly we go through flags here with the wind that whips through. Mm -hmm. um, Why was there like no, nothing expended on flags in like 2017, 2018? I don't know because I've seen. I've seen the because flags. Because I've seen the flags, so I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Where that trip, where that cost went to. Okay. Don't we get that from the veterans? So don't they supply flags for all the town buildings? They provide. No, we we purchase the flags, but they do all the. Uh, Okay. Oh, yeah. they do that? Okay, so that's where the purchase comes. Yeah, at least okay. that's, that's my understanding. Okay. But why haven't we committed, we haven't paid for the last two years? I don't know. Yeah. They got put in the wrong line item. Don't get me started on yeah. line items. Okay. okay. Don't get me started on line items. <laughs> <laughs> and then start, since last year we've, we've appropriated $1,500 um, to help us with the, with the yeah. We call them the special projects, though. The DeMaio property, the uh -huh. Blue School, the Center School. If we need to do a perk test or we need to do a survey or we uh -huh. need to do something, it's a small pot of money that we have okay. that we can access to facilitate those, the movement of those okay. properties. And then when those properties are taken care of, then that presumably uh, gets phased out of the budget right. in the future. Okay. Yep. Until we find other months enough to there, yeah, there, take there, on yeah, a special no, project. Usually no shortage of things to take on. 
does, does the winter maintenance in here include our contract with, with Billy Smith? That is the contract. That is Andrew our contract with okay. Smith, yeah. And based on the past couple of years, I think we can lower it. Mm -hmm. Although FY 2018, I double checked. That's the cost that's in there, but it seems a little. I don't remember what the winter was, but it seems pretty low. Last year? Oh, yeah, 800 seems uh, really low. Something got charged for a different budget line. It could have been. So, uh, Steve, just comment. You've got custodian at the, at the top of that. And I read somewhere that just for the, well, you've got a just job description somewhere. Yeah. Uh, that does not include the police station. You know, if that was one of his comments, if we were to add, uh, I can't imagine, an hour a week maybe or something, is that right. Right. possible? Or two hours a week for his cleaning? I think it needs to, it's a discussion that needs to happen. Yeah. Um, I know there's concerns about privacy concerns and oh, okay. things like that. It's, the job description is written so that it doesn't exclude it. Right. Okay. Um, okay. So other buildings. Yeah. Plus other buildings. Yeah. It'll be. So, uh, yeah. There's issues to work out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But that's 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 budgeted right now for six hours a week. Okay. Have you had any? Have you done anything to advertise on that yet? No, we're trying to get everything. Okay. We'll okay. talk about or maybe we'll talk about next. Get the ducks in a row. Okay. Okay. All right, I think I understand our budget. Okay. So those are the two that are most okay. fluid, I think. A lot of the other general government ones are. Well, you'll, I'll send them out before the next meeting, but those are the ones that are the most fluid. Okay. Where, where does our uh, FERCOG dues come up? Is it in here or is it somewhere else? The FERCOG assessment? Yeah. For which our general, so general there's a general program. assessment. Right. Um, It'll be, in, I can send you that out. It's a separate line item. So is that in the administration? It's not under general it? government, though. It's under um, unclassifieds. Was that in the other day? Did we have yep. that? Oh, okay. okay. Well, that's, that's fine. I'll, I'll see that. I think, I think there was a small decrease. Yeah, okay. Overall. Okay, that's fine. And I think the programs, the, the, the shared programs that we participate in, inspections was level and Counting, I think, was up a little bit. Okay. All right. So, um, discuss and vote on 2020 recommendations of the personnel committee. And uh, uh, you're doing so nicely. Uh, do you want to read that? Well? Sure. I tried to summarize what the personnel committee had talked about and. Mm -hmm. I thought it was accurate. I don't know. I was hoping so because I go by memory and sometimes it doesn't always work. But um, do you want me to just read these and we can talk about Sure, one by one. I don't know if we want to. Which, which and and, want I, don't, and I don't know how much of it is. We, we have, um, like, what do we really, what, are we the ones who really get to say the 2.5% cost of living? I think the Finance Committee has a little word on that. We can certainly say where we weigh in. Right. We're still allowed to have opinions. You're allowed to have opinions. The way that, the way that I've been told that, and I, I think that our bylaws support this, is that the finance committee recommends the budget to town meeting, the operations budget to town mm -hmm. meeting. Um, but it, so, if you didn't agree with something, then that would get put in the warrant that says the select board does not recommend this budget because. There's little line items that say select so board recommends. Right, It would yeah. say that. Um, so, uh, one here is the personnel committee voted to recommend a two and a half percent cost of living increase for fiscal year 2020, uh, based on the applicable consumer consumer price index and other local government agencies. Um, yeah. Personnel committee voted to recommend an increase in the administrative assistant position. For 24 hours per week to 30 hours per week for 18 weeks. The purpose of the increase is to ensure adequate staffing during the busiest times of year, which being now, mm -hmm. um, that's when it will be most helpful to have um, the administrative assistant essentially in the office three days a week instead of two and a quarter mm -hmm. because um, 
we don't pay separately for meetings so that if we spend right. six hours or seven hours in meetings well there's a day right. it's a, almost a full day out of the office yeah. which makes it and if you're done like two, two and a quarter and three those are 10 hour days yeah right these are, these are not not a bunch of like slack or you know, banker's hours sort of things. These, so, just, these are hefty, yes. uh, long days that go up into the evening. Eight. eight. Last night was eight to eight. Yeah. And is that position eligible for cop time? Eligible for cop time? Yeah. No. No, it has to be a full time position. Cop time would only accrue after 40 hours. But if they were to work over 40 hours, then they'd be eligible for overtime. So it's a week time, it's not a day. So, it's if they're more than eight hours a day, that's That's my understanding, right? Okay. Uh, three. The personnel committee voted to recommend changes to the holiday section of the personnel policy that would provide employees with a half day, so four hour Christmas Eve day holiday, and only when it falls on a weekday. Yeah, and, and I think this was to also try to preempt any more, like every year, let's just wing it and do something different every year, depending that, so that kind of, it's unwritten here, and I don't know how to write it into the policy, but like, thou shalt not go to the select board and say, I really want a full day, mm. or we want, you know, would you grant us all another half day? It was, this, this was to basically say, well, let's just do this once and for all, and then people can count on it, they can plan on it, and uh, it'll be um, it'll be settled, and we won't have this every year, everybody wondering what's gonna happen. Right? The New Year's Eve day come up as well? Right, but they decided on just the- Just this one, yeah. okay. Um, number four, the personnel committee voted to recommend changes to the highway superintendent job description that makes the position responsible for all town-owned buildings under the control and direction of the select board. <coughs> The committee also recommended that with the additional responsibilities being added to the job description that the pay increase by, so it breaks down to $87 per week or $4,500 annual increase for those additional job responsibilities. So how many hours does that reflect? Um, Three-ish. 87, is that three hours? Yeah, yeah, I think it's around three. I don't have, I don't yeah, have the exact. It's probably three point something. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it means roughly at a $30 an hour rate. Yeah. And, that's and then the personnel committee voted to recommend the, the town building's custodian job description. Both of those are attached. Yeah. Um, the things that personnel com the personnel committee is meeting next Tuesday, I believe, and they're still discussing. There was a requested salary increase from the chief of police for a 3% increase, and uh, we're, we're completing our research on whether the water superintendent's salary might need to be adjusted um, based on the salary survey that the personnel committee is using. So I don't know yeah. what, what, if anything, we want to I, do, I should um, mention that the, um, the highway superintendent job description was something that the personnel committee wanted to come back to revisit next year, treat the um, the one we, the draft we have, which is basically making some small changes to the highway superintendent's description. Um, let, let's treat this as a draft. Let's see how it works for the next year. Once we've got, you know, a few months, uh, I don't know, at the point next time we meet, it wouldn't be a full year, but we have at least a good chunk of a year of experience, um, then we can come back to it and see if it needs any changes. So that would definitely be on the agenda for next year's uh, as well so this to, to keep looking at it and make sure that it actually um, is is fitting right, okay so this is still a draft is position description no this is this is only approved with the notion that we will come back to it in a year as well okay. to revise it if necessary okay. but we definitely will come back and look at it again So I think to the one, two, 
I think that the, the job descriptions would have to be approved by the select board. Um, and I think the holiday policy would be approved by the select board. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Obviously, because the administrative assistant is under the select board, we'd also want the select board yeah. to. But didn't, didn't we ask them to do number two, so. Right, <laughs> so I. I, I right. think that'll be an easy vote. I wouldn't have gone ahead with that. <laughs> Yeah. You want to know the question. You want to know the answer to the questions before you ask the questions, right? Right. right. Um, but definitely, definitely two, three, four, and five would need the okay. approval of the select board to make them final because the personnel committee are, is an yeah. advisory body. So. Well, do you want to take them one at a time? Or? Well, the only question I have is that number five, I guess. Oh, okay. Custodian job, you know, yeah, custodian job description. You talk about snow removal. Is, is this, it was clear whether they were doing this porches, walkways, and sweeping walkways. Is, is our contract, contractor doing that that we hired to do, or is this? So the intent would be that when that stuff is needed, not when the, the contractors going to show up so if it snows they're going to show up and they're going to clear everything yeah. but if there's so the perfect example would have been what three weeks ago when snow came mm -hmm. off the town uh, the town hall roof and covered the sidewalk or yeah. you know we have a thaw and freeze well you know mm -hmm. our contractors not necessarily going to come to do that so you know throwing salt down or or if, yeah. say it's windy and the snow, snow blows, it, yeah. it wouldn't be, it would be sort of as needed. Right. Okay, because I guess it wasn't clear whether he was doing it all the time at, right. or, or part time. No, that because then uh, you have to get somebody with a you can't be more with, hours. Yeah. transport and a snowblower and <coughs> you yeah. have to do all that equipment. We have to purchase that equipment. So that was the intent there, was that it was. Okay. Okay, I make, a, I make a motion that we we approve uh, items two, three, four, and five of the personnel committee recommendations here on March 13th, 2019. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, town administrator updates. So we want to defer one to the joint. Finance Committee select for me. Right. I, yeah. Personally, I, I have no problem with the, their recommendation. I know they made it based on uh, lots of data. So, uh, I, I personally am good with that. But I guess it, if it's not something that we need to make, like we're not making a recommendation to the Finance Committee. Not that. Well. Right. Okay. All right. Switch up here too. Yeah. So, Amy reached out to the, um, which ones are these people? This is the Waitley Diner. The Waitley Diner about, hey, let's partner together and install charging stations for this grant program. And that was their response is that yeah. No interest in that. I'm very disappointed in yeah. mm -hmm. um, When they come in for their liquor license, let's talk about electric condition. charging stations. Mm -hmm. um, and so she also reached, you also reached out to, to, to Mass DOT, yeah. and they were very cold on the idea, which is very mm -hmm. surprising. Could we put one in for here or at the center of town? Um, we could. That's, I, mean, that's I, I would use it. I would, I would be plugged in right now. <laughs> if, if, uh, if we had one here. Right. Uh, um, the only question, one of the questions I had at the town hall is, yeah, are we taking a parking space yeah. away? Yeah. So um, that might that might not be a great idea then. Right. Um, I'll, I'll revisit the, um, the grant program to see uh, if we could do it on, what would the cost okay. be for, for municipal property? Um, but. Okay. I don't think we should give up the the, the park and ride. Um, <coughs> it was 
which was surprising. I, I, I would have thought that Mass DOT would, well, surprising, not surprising, that Mass DOT would have sort of be leading the charge on this. Um, oh, because, what a great pun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't think about that. Um, it, it seems like an obvious thing that they might want to make yeah. happen, especially if, if Maybe I'll bring that up on Friday when I see our if the administration as charges. if the administration as a whole is is pursuing all of these green energy and yeah. these green energy projects, then you know a thousand one questions about you know how we're going to do it and go file a permit and all this stuff was not mm -hmm. the response we were expecting. Yeah. Um, but I also want to have a conversation. The Department of Energy Resources to see if they can, if okay. anybody gives us how we could crack that, crack that nut. But I don't know if it'll be through this program. Maybe we don't want to set a precedent. Parking rights. Yeah, I, I, I was start here. It's gonna did a little bit of research, and it off. seems like they only have very few very charging few. stations. And yeah. I think the only ones that I saw were, I think, along the Pike. I think Eastern Mass. Yeah. Well, certainly Eastern oh, Mass, of course. Yes. They gotta take care of the Eastern Mass first before we can. Yeah. yeah. Throw no, us a no chip on my shoulder. Um, okay. So we don't give up, but we're disappointed with you, Whaley Diner. Right. Um, so Nupro, who is occupying our space mm -hmm. um, and paying us uh, rent each month, has found a much larger facility. For the warehousing needs, so we received their notice to quit. Um, so they'll be here for another five months. I think a lot of their stuff has already moved out, but they'll be paying us for the next five months. Um, so that space will be free. And as if we needed another project, here it is. Um, mm -hmm. How did we get New Pro in there? Did we just like advertise that we have warehousing? Um, I think it was word of mouth. Mm. Oh. They wanted to. They had a their warehouse. They had moved to Whaley from Greenfield, mm -hmm. and they were still warehousing in Greenfield, and I think they heard that oh, okay. the town was here, and they came over one day and said, hey, do you guys have any space out back? Mm. It's your lucky day. Oh, okay. Um, they were, it, it was a good relationship. They, yeah, they, they it seemed required, like a very nice tenant. Yeah, it required no upgrade, you know, didn't require any modifications to the, to the back space, yeah. except for that double door. Um, is it yeah? Is it worth something to advertise? Um, I mean, since it's a like, should be like a real estate rental, I don't know if you can get actual real estate agents involved. But yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I I I'm not really sure. Not being a professional in the area, might be you might have a better idea of. Well, I've seen them in paper listed in rental places. Yeah, so we'll have to get some more. Oh, okay. Um, All right. But obviously the. Obviously, if we rented it before five months, then they would happily, you know, they'll not happily, pay, they'll happily not pay us. They'll, yeah. Yes. But presumably, we only do that if someone else wants to get in there earlier, right? But you, right. Could, you could add that to your list if you're talking to the state, because I do see ads for state, certain offices looking for rental space. Uh, yeah. But the, we're too small, I think, for what they're looking for. Right. And the challenge we have is we have an empty, we have an empty right. back room. Yeah, warehouse like room. Right, and there's, you know, there's outfit, there, there's costs to modify that space if you're going to use it as a, yeah, yeah. for right. office space. Right. And for warehouse space, yeah, the, the ceilings are high, but they're not that high. And mm -hmm. it, it's kind of a, it's kind of a unique, unique space. Yeah. Really good for a library. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, that would be uh -huh. an excellent idea. Now they are, I think BOG is, is running on State Road, and they're no longer, if, if that project goes through with the solar, I mean with the marijuana retail, they're no longer going to be in there. Maybe that's well, it. Yeah. The, the, the bookstore, the old bookstore, you see uh -huh. BOG trucks there all the time. They're renting. We were there. Yeah. Oh, thing. Okay. And, you know, that's a lot, that rental there is a lot smaller space than what we have here. I, I, I don't know. I don't know where they're going. 
But well, why maybe, are they even there? And then we can know. talk them into putting some electric charging yeah. stations in it. They're yeah. parking right. I don't know why they're there. That's what what, what office is, is yeah. there even? You know, and, and hey, maybe having an electric charging station here would be attractive to a tenant. Yeah. Just saying. Okay. Um, quite honestly, this, I've forgotten about this. We applied for a downtown initiative technical assistance grant. Um, yeah, I want to say it was almost I feel like a year ago. I feel like it was, like it was a long time ago. But um, yeah. I don't remember what it was, but they said thanks, but no thanks. And that was to Not so sort of do mm -hmm. some, okay. some branding of the town, which they had funded in a neighboring town, but apparently do it here. Yeah. Um, there's just a notice of the of the proposed chapter uh, chapter 90 funds from 44 8 11. Mm -hmm. Of course the question that I'm asking myself right now is what did we get last year and I don't have that. But I could find out for you. Okay. Um, and then the last thing is is this letter. I think we had seen this letter. Yeah last but I, last it week. wasn't in your packets. But I think it was an email to, yeah, to everybody. Not, Just the historical know. commission wants yeah. involved in the, the yeah. sidewalks project. And, and yeah. Well, my question after reading this a second time, I didn't think of it the first time. I mean, I sent a quick note back to Donna saying, that sounds really great. I'm, and um, the, my question, I guess, is how do we, what's the mechanism by which we include the historical commission in on it, uh, on all of these things. I mean, they won't necessarily have veto power on things, but we definitely right. want to uh, be able to have their input and listen to their concerns and adjust things as um, as needed. But what's the good mechanism for doing that? That's what I don't know. So I think it's going to... Because we've hired the consultant, or we started that ball rolling last night. Or also in we can update about that too. Oh, okay. Um, I think it will be um, more of an involved comment. That that's how I see it. It's happened. I don't think I don't think they need to be involved in the sort of the, the detail worry, you mm -hmm. know, sort of the down in the weed stuff that keep in the engineering we're talking about. But I think at the conceptual level of Sidewalk, you know, mm -hmm. sidewalk location. So, I see them having um, chances for imp input at each of the design stages. Okay. Um, or, uh, so it means inviting them to meetings where things are being reviewed. Yeah, um, but but at the early enough stage where, so at a stage where they can provide meaningful comment. Yeah. Um, okay. About things that are important to them, which I would assume would be sidewalk layout. That's one of the um, things they mentioned, right? Yeah. yeah. And well, even the veterans memorial. Things, and then in terms of the veterans memorial. So, are you proposing a separate notice to them every time we meet on projects in the center of town, or, or involve the well, historic commission? Well, I communicate with Donna on a regular basis, yeah. and she's the, she's mm -hmm. the chair, so. Oh, okay, so can you, you'll communicate with the chair. Yeah. Um, yeah, as appropriate. You know, when, uh, when their input yeah. um, can be yeah. helpful and um, meaningful. Yeah, the ad, hoc, the ad hoc committee that we have for the Better Tomorrow is, mm -hmm. has been very, has been, from my point of view, very conscious of the historical oh. significance of the, the space and its location within the historical district. Okay. Um, so it turns out that the person who we wanted to hire for for the mm -hmm. sidewalk construction project, we need to figure this out. But it appears that Mass DOT has a engineered pre-qualification requirement, and they need to pre-qualify your engineer before your engineer can do any design work on Mass DOT funded projects. No. Oh. Now this, is, as I understand it, as as Keith explained it to me, it's you need to have a certain level of certification so that you can mm -hmm. design, I think it's design highways or design roads, um, but we're not doing, we're, no, we're no, not no, doing no. either of those. Um, yeah. There is a waiver process uh -huh. that can be applied for, 
um, the person that Keith needed to speak to was was out of the office for a couple of days. So this is something we realized at the beginning of the week. Mm -hmm. um, it was clear that there was a pre-qualification for contractors, the person who's going to build work. the project. Um, it was less clear that there's, at, at the outset, there was, it was less clear that the engineer needed to be pre-qualified by MassDOT. And there's not a ton of those in Western Massachusetts. And the ones that, um, the ones that are are the bigger engineering firms. And um, it's gonna cost a lot more money than what? Right. So we should go for the waiver, it yeah. sounds like. So well, what, what did Sunderland do? This person was did it for Sunderland. I think it never got flat. Okay. Was my guess. Or can you talk to the, the person and it wasn't an issue then? Would that come up then? Okay. Um, no, it never came up in Sunderland. Never came up. <laughs> okay. Um, at least that's that's what I've been told. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. To or, be determined yeah. for that. Or maybe. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. But it, the waiver seems like the right way to go. Right. And the question. <coughs> I. We'll have to see how. Yeah. Freely they. Grant waivers. Hopefully, if it's sidewalk replacement. We're not designing we're a not bridge building. We're not designing a four lane nice. highway. Um, yeah. Okay. So we'll have to see. But that was just so it seems like it's, it's worth pursuing. Uh, yeah. Because of the money it would save yeah. and the uh, the our comfort level with the person that's on their land used. Right. Yeah. It's okay. purely a bureaucratic hurdle that increases project costs. Okay. Because I, I would expect something. Probably three or four times. Yeah. But that's probably low too. Mm, yeah. Um, I, easily ten times the cost right. to hire one of these pre-qualified. Yeah. Okay. Well, and I'd say it's not a money, but for the design, the, the grant's not covering design. So that's right. Yeah. It is. It is our money. It is. It is chapter ninety funds. Yeah. That's what right. we yeah. pay for. But well, you could always ask other towns that that got. Complete street money. Who they were hired? Yeah. If it comes to comes to that, if yeah, this one like isn't yeah. pre-qualified or it takes too long to qualify, yeah. I guess. Yeah, I wonder if like, it didn't get applied because maybe it's in the gray area, and when you apply for a waiver, you might find out. Oh, wait a minute, they were never supposed to apply this to begin with. I mean, I could imagine that sort of confusion going on as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That could happen. Yeah. Okay. Well, do we have any items not anticipated within 48 hours of the meeting? Yeah, almost a special town meeting, but... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> almost, but that was 48 hours. Okay. Okay, I would entertain a motion to adjourn that. Okay, second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye.